Welcome everyone to this week's uh, program of Ascend TV, Life on the Autism Spectrum. Today, our guests are prominent musicians, Craig Browning and Myron Cohen, and we'll be joined uh, interviewing them by uh, Ascend creator and uh, co-founder, I should say, Camilla Bixler. But before we begin, I'd like to ask uh, my co-host, uh, Will Burnick. Will, what's with your t-shirt? I'm glad you asked. This is my best buddy shirt I've had for a while. Best Buddies is having their annual friendship walk this year on Saturday, April 23rd in Golden Gate Park. This will be their first in-person walk in three years. We're glad that Best Buddies is coming back in person. We've we've been waiting we've been waiting for this since since COVID started. We encourage everyone to participate, just like we encourage everyone to participate, just like they used to. to spread the, go out and invite your friends and and tell them to participate in in the best place friendship walk this this year myron can you tell us about your, your collaboration with craig uh, my name is myron cohen very quickly and i first had the good fortune to meet craig browning at the cinema grill uh, located in the historic alameda theater in alameda california i was hosting music there for approximately five years five nights a week and I had the good fortune again to meet Larry Noble as one of my musicians who would play there occasionally. Larry frequently told me about this great musician that he knew that he wanted me to meet. Craig was holding forth on a Hammond shop down Hammond B3 organ with a Leslie speaker. And I could see he really could play, number one. Number two, however, he was, uh, we, we used the expression, he had handcuffs on because he was forced to back up some good musicians, but mostly very mediocre amateur musicians who didn't know the key they were singing in. They jumped the bar line, on and on and on and on. But I recognized very quickly he had great talent. And I started to frequent Monday night sessions, but I would arrive early and play for an hour with Craig, where we would absolutely kill playing, playing Jimmy Smith tunes and Larry Young tunes. Thank you very much, Myron. We'll now have our guest interviewer, uh, Camilla Bixler, uh, with a few questions for Craig and Myron. So Craig, what, what is, would you say uh, is your genre of music? What kind of music do you play? Jazz, that's more my my skill set. I had, you know, I sort of, when I was a small kid, I had an auto harp, you know, which is, again, has the the, the damper bars, so that only the strings of certain chord tones. I mean, so you can just, you know, you can learn a type of stuff on it, you know. But, um, you, know, uh, you know, that was sort of my untrained natural ability. Uh, one of the things that, well, my dad played piano mostly from the old fake books, me from tune decks cards. You know, he was a fan of the music, of the, especially like the 20s, 30s, and 40s. And, you know, he you know, sort of played by ear, but he, he, you know, often had time problems and things like that. But nonetheless, you know, I, I think I sort of picked up some aspects of music as a second language, just from my, my dad's, you know, endeavors. Craig, you gotta lean forward a little bit so they can see you in the camera. See the middle? The yeah, middle. Uh, it's, it's hard to do that. Okay. Craig, did you have any teachers that were very helpful to you? Um, let me see. Um, probably the, fortunately, the, the piano teacher I was with the longest, you know, as a child, was a woman named Jean Drake, who was a student of Fred Satman. Fred Satman had taught a lot of local musicians. I think Dave Brubeck had some exposure to him. There was a theater organist who was more jazz minded named Larry Venucci. He had connection. There was a pianist who worked with a group called the Master Sounds and the features on the Montgomery Brothers named Richie Crabtree. He was one of Satman's students also. But anyway, Gene was good. At, I mean, I did. Have, I, I was never a good classical player, but I did. She did teach music theory through learning. You know, like. When this did, um, you know, fear release that stuff. I was never really great at that, but nonetheless, when I learned it, we wrote the chords out. I mean, I played it by rote, more or less. But I, but you know, we did discuss how the primary chords work and stuff like that. So she didn't just teach sight reading the way a lot of music teachers do. And then also, by the time I was um, actually, I think around tenth um, grade, I started check out the jazz program at Chabot College, at least in the evenings. There was a guy named Frank Samaris, who was the instructor there, who was a jazz pianist, and he was one of their main instructors. Or Ed Kelly. 
Um, I never did anything formal with Ed Kelly, but I did go to the jam sessions at Laney College. You know, a lot of this was sort of a little before I was old enough to legally get into bars. I did sneak into bars, but I was there for the music, so I never got into the trouble that a lot of people get into sneaking into bars underage. I looked overage. One of my frustrations, I was about 14. I was forced to pay adult fees on the bus. You know, I still had a, at least a year or two before I had to pay the adult fee, but, you know, the bus driver wouldn't believe that I was still underage, so. Well, what are your aspirations for the future? What are things that you want to do now and you'd like to do in the future? Well, I mean, I mean, it's just, um, a lot of it is, is how to get around obstacles. I mean, there's the challenge of being the victim of one's success, but it's like, I mean, I mean, one could, you know, the, the simplistic answer is being able to, you know, play nicer clubs, get paid better, hopefully not get overwhelmed by that. But, you know, I mean, the whole, you know, kind of, you know, schemes of disabled person in relationships, I got, you know, the biggest violin to play over that stuff. Um, and um, coming from a family that had some dysfunctional baggage that probably got in the way of that also. Um, uh, I mean, recently I've been kind of working on a, at least a semi-nomadic existence, co house, the cost of housing being ridiculous and that sort of thing. I've, I've taken up being a van dweller at least part-time. I sort of want to have some sort of a home base, but I want to make it something that's, you know, economical and I don't have to work, run into as an act of desperation. You know, on the other hand, I want to mm -hmm. stay out of harm's path as far as parking any place dangerous, either in terms of street crime or having to deal with the police in a negative way or whatever. So that's part okay. of my existence ex at this point. And I have um, one question and maybe both you and Myron can talk about it. Myron said that um, you communicate with him in music. That's your strongest mode of communication. Let me ask I, you one more. I, I guess if we do, it's kind of hard to explain with, with regular words. It's just I mean, yeah. some ways it's listening and being able to adjust. I can't say I play perfectly, but it's like, you know, even if you're imperfect, you can sort of learning how to adjust rather than having to play with the ultimate, ultimate perfection. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of stuff. I mean, if you look at it, even a lot of professional sh chefs, it's a, they don't exactly measure things. They can sprinkle a little of, you know, whatever in and, the, and, it, and it comes out, you know, as a five-star gourmet meal or whatever. <laughs> Craig, we've already heard that for you and for many others, music is your language. So could you say something to us here and to our viewers? In other words, could you play something that speaks to you that you'd like to share? Thank you very much again, Craig. That was really great to hear. Myron, could you elaborate a little bit on what you and uh, Craig just played and also then lead in with what Craig may be playing next? Thank you. 
That was a spirited version of an impression of Ray Charles, who we were both lucky to, to see numerous times. I actually uh, got a few, uh, a few opportunities to actually sit with Ray Charles. Another story for another time. But anyway, uh, that's a kind of a feeling that if you have a brain, you'll go back to the early Atlantic recordings where Ray Charles live at uh, 1954, live at Newport, et cetera, et cetera. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of examples of his playing. And that was what we call a Chicago cha-cha, better, better known as uh, the beat is and that's the phrasing. And then Craig puts his own little two four in there and he, uh, he creates a kind of a feeling of, okay, I listened to Ray Charles. I loved his playing, Jimmy Smith. Larry Young, these are some of my influences, Otis Spann, but I'm gonna put a little Craig Browning in there, okay? That's what he did. So uh, I just threw a little rhythmical accompaniment, just playing a snare with my hands lightly. I hope it wasn't too loud. And uh, that beat is again known as a Chicago cha-cha, uh, Southside Chicago, uh, Freddie Bilo, and specifically uh, a drummer who I, uh, who I knew once robbed me, tried to rob me once with another story. <laughs> he worked with Ray Charles for probably five years and recorded on uh, 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 some of Ray Charles' hits. Uh, I'll, I'll relate that at another time, but it's uh, up to Craig now to, to channel Ray Charles if he wishes and let him determine what he'll play. But I think it might have something to do with uh, one of Ray Charles' biggest hits. And all I'll say, well, it starts with well, I don't, um, Georgia. I, um, I'll, I'll oh, play yeah. that. I don't know if it's really done, but, you know. Um, you know, um, I, I mean, I do. Just fucking know. play it, don't worry. Right. Craig, once again, that was wonderful. Now, now, Myron, you had mentioned that Craig has an incredibly broad encyclopedic knowledge of music. Uh, could you go into that a little bit with him? Certainly. What I'm going to do is throw, a, throw the gauntlet down to Craig, because I've experienced this with him many, many times. I'm going to hum a Hum a little phrase, an R&B phrase, uh, which he'll know where it comes from, who wrote it first, and you'll have to suffer through my terrible, terrible voice. But I'll give you an example to Craig, 
and then he'll go with it and then he'll try to play the phrase. And uh, all I'll say is, Craig, we're going to talk about Little Richard. Boody boom. I'm going to go Boody boom bap. Boody boom ba ba boom ba ba Boody boom ba ba da boody ba. Go ahead. Where did that come from? I don't know where that came from. Jenny, Jenny, Jenny. As I say, my knowledge is a little more great American song book jazz. Okay. I mean, I know some other things. I mean, I know some odd facts about rock and country and western and other things. But this. Oh, let's go with Ray Charles. That's the intro to I'm Busted. It's actually a country song. I don't know anything about the original version. Let's give a little bit of it. Sings in that part, did it? Okay, how about uh, 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 Oh Marianne? Oh Marianne, we, we already did that. That's, okay. that, that's how that. about the, the uh, how about uh, the New Orleans thing that we, we played? Um, we didn't do that yet. Um, I try to think, um, um, as, I, as, I, as I say, I'm not really the Savant of everything, I kind of know my kind of uh, you know kind of my specialty thing. You know, uh, if I try to know every, uh, then all of a sudden everyone wants to play every you know pop song that goes. And that, that's every pop song from the two thousands on. You know? Okay, we're gonna up the ante. Thelonious Monk. So that. Bo bi a ba da bo bo do bo. Okay, that was Bimsha Swing, correct? Yeah, I think so, yeah. What has, been, what has been your favorite collaboration so far? Well, there are so many uh, moments in time that Craig and I played together, usually backing other musicians because we would usually have the uh, an hour or 45 minutes to ourselves where we would do a jazz, uh, a, a jazz duo, a, B, a organ, uh, organ uh, B3 with, a, with me on a full set of drums. But... I just want to give you one really, really funny, funny, hysterically funny situation in life that sometimes something that occurs on the bandstand, 10 years later, that person uh, appears again in your life. So this is an example. Let me set the stage. Uh, a rough bar in Alameda called The Fireside. Craig holding court there every Monday, backing many different musicians for at least 10 years, five or 10 years. Uh, they gave him a very small guarantee and he would get the tip jar. Minuscule, minuscule amount of money for the great talent that he, that he has. So make a long story short, uh, Craig and I were backing a bunch, of, a bunch of vocalists and this delightful woman, I'll, I'll remember her name in a second, was playing. And you always have like five or 10 guys, usually men who don't know any better, honking on their tenor saxophones, saxophones and their trumpets. They, they don't know crap, but, but we're there to help them increase their talent and Craig is much more patient than me so what happens this woman is singing beautifully she's doing a great job and you have to sign in on a sign-up sheet to sit in right so there's more organization here and I could I can see this guy he's about 210 pounds he's a big forgive my language but he's a big big guy he's got a huge tone but every time he blows in his horn he screws up Badly, I'm going. Hey, you are going to have to back this guy up, okay? And Craig knows him. Craig is nodding. He's giving him the Jewish high sign. Okay, okay. Just wait, wait, wait. So what does this son of a bitch do? He jumps up on the bandstand in the middle of this woman's solo, vocal solo, which was great, and he starts honking, honking like like twenty <laughs> geese. Oh no, I can't play. Can't play. This is ten years ago. And what do I do? Craig just looks at me like, help, help. He's just gonna look like Myron. Do something. 
I jump off the drums. I don't even know who this guy is. And I grab him by the throat. I'm a little violent. I grab him by the throat because the bandstand is sacred. And I do one of these, what the F are you doing? Get down here. And I just throw him <laughs> off the bandstand. Literally. I almost hit him. I was so angry because he was so rude, effing rude. <laughs> what happened was 10 years later, I get a phone call. Uh, Myron, uh, this is Judge Jeff Tolber. I'm trying to imitate this man. Uh, I'm working with Craig and we have this gig and would you come and play some with us? We're playing at the Ricky the Riveters outside and it's quite nice and I pay Craig a hundred dollars. Essentially translation, translation, I pay Craig a hundred dollars to make me look good, okay? So turns out this guy that I'm was popped in the mouth is a judge, a retired <laughs> judge who's become a dear friend of Craig, a mentor of his, and he employs Craig and when uh, we need a little, uh, how shall I say, uh, a little extra push to put pressure on those who are in power for, for, for Craig's, we schlep in, I schlep in Judge Jeff, who's just a great guy. And his, his musicianship has gotten so much better with Craig <laughs> teaching him, right? And me going, put that goddamn tenor down and pick up your soprano. You sound like crap. <laughs> and, and 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 I can because I got the Jewish humor right. Plus I'm a very good musician. I, you know I you know so. But uh, Craig, Craig, again has the ability, the ability to transform the bandstand. And this is an example of something that I remember from from many years ago, which I think injects some humor. The guy that I almost hit in the mouth, uh, that I physically grabbed him by the throat, turns out to be Craig's employer now. He's a retired. A uh, municipal judge named Jeff Talber. Good guy, good guy. <laughs> his relationship has gotten so much better because of Craig having Craig in his corner. How's that for a story? Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I am Jennifer Brooks, your book reviewer for Life on the Autism Spectrum. And on today's episode, we have heard Craig and Myron. Wait, those are their names, right? Craig and Myron tell us about how music plays into their lives. So today I'm going to tell you about the book, Speaking for Ourselves, Conversations on Life, Music, and Autism. This is an anthology edited by a professor from Florida State University in Tallahassee, their capital, Michael B. Bacon. He speaks with 10 different autistic people with a great deal of musical talent. Many of them play musical instruments and are interested in all kinds of music from Beethoven to Peruvian music. I mean, really, it spans the entire spectrum. So, and also spanning the age range from 10 years old up through adulthood, both male and female and gender non-binary. And one of the questions he asks one interviewee who he has given the name Donald Rindale You've referred twice in the last couple of exchanges to being wrong. I don't know, I didn't know what was wrong. It would have just clarified to me what was wrong. I begin the question. In the autistic self-advocacy literature, there is a defiant thread of there is nothing wrong with me that permeates the discourse. Do you really feel as opposed to think that something is quote wrong with you? Or is it more a question of living in a wrong-headed world that won't take you for what you are? I, for one, am finding you to be very much right in the way you think, express yourself, etc. And Donald, the pseudonym, answers, I certainly do feel that this is the case of the world being wrong-headed and not taking me for what I am. But when I do feel that way, I do wish that I wasn't this way. Certainly having this condition has allowed me to apply a rather exceptional degree of focus to academic studies and has facilitated my success in certain professional respects. 
but if I was afforded the proverbial pill or magic wand to take this away, I definitely would. That's a minority opinion among the people who were interviewed from this book. Most of them said, no, they wouldn't. Temple Grandin says that she would not. Another question also asked of Donald is, Earlier, you alluded to how studying philosophy of mind has sparked in you an awareness of how different you are from others and a motivation to find out how and why. Can you take me through a quick synopsis of how that process unfolded? Now, I personally never studied philosophy except for one ethics course in college, but all through school, starting as early as first grade, I had some sense that I was different from other girls. Donald says, to answer the question, sure, as best as I can recall, basically some kind of connection was forged or light bulb went off in my head after reading so much of that literature, which made me realize that I was indeed quite different from others and there must have been something wrong, i.e. some kind of therefore unidentified problem by virtue of which I was quite different and unusual in contrast to mostly everyone who I had known, but the name of which I did not know. At that point, I, Donald, was already clinically depressed and was going to counseling for it and decided to bring up some of these other concerns. I had learned a bit about autism spectrum conditions and found that I matched the general descriptions and the specific symptomatologies very closely. Eventually, the psychologist introduced to me the fact that no two people diagnosed with an ASD, that's autism spectrum disorder, are really the same and that there was a spectrum of diversity and problems associated with the condition generally construed. Then came the affirmation and acceptance of the diagnosis and the self-imposed mantra that this is one of my greatest strengths. Then came the realization through philosophy that I was truly quite different from everyone else and the realization of how other people must see me and what they must think about me. Then came a real sadness over the whole thing. Yes, I'm sure many of us can relate to Donald's feelings. Another question that Michael asks of the people he interviewed for this book is, what would you most like to express to the world at large, as it were, from your perspective as an autistic musician, a thoughtful person, and a caring individual? This is how a person named Graeme Gibson, who is very interested in the music of the Indian subcontinent and the differences between the northern and the southern part of the subcontinent, although the Americans tend to think of it as homogenous. This was his response. I would like to express to the rest of the world that you judge me for who I am as a person, not based on what I am. Autism is a part of who I am, but I do not allow for it to define me. In conclusion, as you meet us, you find will find we are just as diverse and different from one to the next as other people are. We all have our own life stories. All we ask for is simply to be treated with the same respect as we would be if we were not autistic when it comes to interacting with society in general. Bravo, Graeme. Well, folks, uh, that's it for this week's program. Until next time, I'm your co-host, Keith Halperin. I'm Will Burnick. Mela Bixler. Wish you a very best Pesach and Easter. Take care. And for all of us here at Ascend TV, the best to you until next time.